the Shaykh begins Dars al-Awwal or the first lesson by mentioning that many of the people they ask us the question and they focus upon a particular question that they keep asking the scholars or the people of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and it is said by them why is it that you people meaning you people who are always talking about the Quran and the Sunnah the way of the Salaf the way of the Salaf that you who ascribe yourselves to Tawheed why is it that you keep mentioning the importance of the issue of Tawheed why is it that you are so much concerned with this issue of Tawheed, of this singling out Allah alone with regard to His rights by way of His worship, by way of His Lordship, by way of His names and attributes. Why is it that you have focused so much upon this issue whilst looking at the rest of the Ummah and what is happening to the affairs of the Ummah? It seems that you are not concerned with the affairs of the Muslims in this time. That you do not, it is as if you are not focusing and, and realizing how the Muslims are being killed, oppressed and how they are being tortured all around the world and it is as if that you are not focusing upon the presence of the kuffar everywhere in the world today and the oppression that they are giving to the Muslims so why is it that you have placed so much importance upon this issue of Tawheed so the Shaykh responds to this shubha to this doubt that they bring by mentioning so he said that so we say that Tawheed is the thing that the Millatul Hanafiya is built upon, that the upright religion, that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established upon the Ard after the creation of Adam alayhi salam, and that which He sent His messengers with, this religion, this upright faith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded the whole of mankind to be upon, then Tawheed is built, or, or, the, or the, the whole of the religion is built upon this issue of Tawheed. And then He mentions that if we ponder over the Quran, and we were to look at it, and we were to, we were to look at, the, uh, at that which the Qur'an is signifying and explaining, then we will see that the Qur'an explains and clarifies Tawheed with perfection. So our concern with Tawheed is a fundamental concern. So much so, that there is not a surah in the Qur'an, not a chapter from the chapters in the Qur'an, except that it deals with the topic and with the issue of Tawheed. Explaining it and forbidding that which opposes it. And Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyya rahimullah ta'ala, the great scholar who died in the year 752 after the Hijrah from the students of Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah ta'ala, who died in the year 728 after the Hijrah, he mentions that Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala confirmed that the Qur'an from its beginning to its very end, the whole of the Qur'an pays a great amount of concern to the issue of Tawheed. In fact, the Qur'an in its totality is Tawheed. Either, he mentions, the Qur'an, it informs us of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it informs us of the names and attributes of Allah. And, Allah, or it informs us of the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, i.e. the Tawheed or rububiyya or, or it commands with the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, without any partners, meaning the Tawheed al-Uluhiyya. And the Qur'an forbids against shirk. And this is, of course, Something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded that we establish the tawheed of uluhiyya for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of establishing the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So he mentions that if we look towards the Quran from its beginning to its end, every single surah of the Quran, every single chapter of the Quran, there is not a single chapter from the chapters of the Quran or a single surah from the surah of the Quran except that it, that it deals and it mentions the importance of the tawheed of Allah. So either it will inform us of the names and attributes of Allah or it will inform us of the Lordship of Allah and that which Allah has created or it will inform uh, Allah has created and sustained and what, that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does by way of his actions or it will inf inform us of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded by way of singling him out for worship and avoiding shirk and associating partners with him either in his Lordship or his worship or with regard to his names and attributes or the Qur'an commands, you'll find that the surah of the Qur'an, the verse, the chapters of the Qur'an that they command with the obedience to Allah or the obedience to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and forbidding disobedience to Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And this is from the rites of Tawheed, its completion and its perfection. So obedience to Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa 
doing that which Allah and His Messenger have commanded, keeping away from that which they have forbidden, then this is from the rights and the completion and the perfection of the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or that if we look towards the Qur'an and we look towards the chapters of the Qur'an, then we will find that the Qur'an or the chapters of the Qur'an, they inform and enumerate the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the Qur'an will inform us of the blessings and the, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the places in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions and enumerates the blessings that He has given us and the victories that He has given to the believers and the success that He will give in this life and the hereafter for Ahlul Tawheed, for the people of Tawheed, those who establish the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to single Him out with regard to His worship, with regard to His names and attributes, with regard to His actions and so on and so forth. Or that if we look towards the Qur'an, it mentions of the exemption for the mushrikeen from punishment in this life, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the mushriks their due in this life, in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them that which they desire in this life. So you find them, that they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows them to have water to drink. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them air to breathe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows them to eat, even though they are mushrikeen, even though they are committing the greatest crime, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is to associate partners with Him. Even though they are committing the greatest crime that could ever be committed, Allah still allows them to breathe. Allah still allows them to drink. Allah still allows them to see. Allah still allows them to walk. Allah still allows them to have children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still gives them the blessings of the earth. So you'll find many of the mushrikeen, the people of shirk, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made them wealthy. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them good health, and so on and so forth. So this is from the exemption that Allah has given them from punishment in this life. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likewise in the Qur'an enumerates for them in the hereafter the adab and the punishment that Allah will give them in the hereafter either in the barzakh, in their graves or upon Yawm Al-Qiyamah when they are raised that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them. So they will be given the eternal abode of the hellfire that they will be thrown into the nar of Jahannam into the, into the hellfire and they will be therein for eternity. Whether he be Jew, whether he be Christian, whether he be Hindu, whether he be from the Sikhs, or from the Buddhists, or from the Communists, or from the Baptists, from those individuals who have committed shirk with Allah, or they have committed kufr with regard to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah has mentioned with regard to them, that their reward is in this life. And as for the hereafter, then all of their good deeds, that they will be turned to dust, and they will be nullified, and in the hereafter they will be in the hellfire for eternity. So the whole of the Qur'an, the whole of the Qur'an revolves around the issue of Tawheed as you can see. So this is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we give him that which he has commanded in the Qur'an. And we give the Tawheed its true permission, its true position. And if you look towards the Qur'an, that we will find that, 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 that this is the right and the position that Allah has given to Tawheed. And Allah has mentioned also the consequence of the neglect of Tawheed. So the whole of the Qur'an revolves around Tawheed. And if you were to scrutinize the, the, the surah of the Qur'an or, the, or, the, or those chapters of the Qur'an that were revealed in the time of Mecca, when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was in Mecca for 13 years, and then he was ordered with the migration, with the hijrah from Mecca to Medina, and he was in Medina for 10 years. So the vast majority, or the, or the majority of his time that he spent in his messengership, and in fact in his life, was spent in Mecca. Before the 40, when before he was 40 years, he spent 40 years in Mecca. Then he, when he was given messengership, the messengership that the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu was was given, it began in Mecca and he was there for 13 years. Then he migrated to Medina at the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he, meant, when he went to Medina, he was in Medina for, for, for the further 10 years. So if you were to scrutinize the Meccan ayat, the verses or the, or the, or the, or the ayat that were revealed in Mecca, you will find that they mainly deal with the issues of Tawheed. That the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu was salam, that he lived in Mecca for 13 years, calling the people to Tawheed and warning them from shirk. So in this time, in general, there was no revelation concerning the obligations and the regulations and the ahkam of the Sharia. So there was nothing concerning zakat that was revealed in Mecca. Nothing concerning siyam and fasting in Mecca, nothing concerning the Hajj and his performance and his regulations in Mecca. And other than that from the Halal and the Haram, and other than that from the dealings and the Mu'amalat and the social interactions, 
and nothing, nothing other than that from the dealings of the business transactions. None of this was revealed in the time of Mecca. None of this was revealed in the time of Mecca. So all of these regulations, they did not come about except after the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, made the hijrah from Mecca to Medina. So all of this time that he was in Mecca, no regulations, no ahkam of the Sharia related to marriage or to divorce or to Hajj or to Umrah or to Zakah or to the rest of the pillars except for the issue of the Salah. As the Shaykh has mentioned, that up, except for the issue of the Salah and even with regard to the issue of the Salah that was only commanded by Allah a year or two years before the migration to Medina. A year or two years before the migration to Medina. So this was made obligatory in Mecca. And it was made on the night of the Isra and the Miraj, Miraj where the Messenger of Allah was taken upon the night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem.